We are in a series called Making Room for Jesus. Thank you. Making Room for Jesus. Now, this is not a series where I'm like, like, hey, you know, I know your life is busy, so kind of like put Jesus in there somewhere. That's not, that's not the point of the room, okay? Jesus should be your whole entire life, okay? It's not just a tiny little part of your life. He's not like an accessory for you. The, the point of this series was this. I, I recognize that this whole year we've been talking about uh, faith in action, being game changers, really transforming the environment by which you live around you by the gospel that God has given to you, the good news that he's given to you. But oftentimes, during that season, what we see is we see distraction that comes along. We see the moment we begin to say, I'm going to commit to God, we see work stress come in. Or we say, well, I'm about to commit to God. We see relationship stress come in or school stress come in. And it distracts us from actually becoming game changers, movers and shakers, history makers, right, for God's kingdom. And so the series was written with the intention of doing your distracted life, during the time when you find yourself so caught up in whatever it is that you find so important to be caught up in, not to be distracted and to have that room for Christ to exist. To remind yourself of where Christ is and continuously live out your life and your testimony with him in the picture. We talked about um, that you're able to do this because you were chosen. Two weeks ago I shared that you were chosen by God. You were elected by God. He chose to save you. There was nothing about your ability or your skill set that gave him the, the, the desire to do it. He chose to do it. We don't know why, but he did it. And because he did that, when you walk around your day-to-day -day life, what should happen is you should never look at another person and think that somehow you're better than them. You were chosen. There's nothing special about you. But at the same time, you should never look at another person and think you're lower than them. You were chosen by God. Sinners saved by grace. Right? It reminds us, it teaches us that in every situation, every contact, every relationship, every partnership, every colleague that we deal with, we ought to have room for Christ. Christ should be in there. He should be a part of that. Because you should not be judging people. You should not be thinking that you're superior or inferior from people. Last week, Evan, uh, we were all gone. Majority of us were gone. No, 30 of us were gone. We are at leadership retreat. We were planning out our, our year for next year for, for you guys. And it's, ex it's exciting. I can't wait to share it with you. But it's going to be a great year. We, we do this every year. We, we bring all of our leaders together. We sit in a place. This year was a little bit different. I asked my mentor to come. You know, I don't really ask my mentor to come unless I really believe in, like, moments of change, right? Like, um, I, I called him. Usually for certain moments. Like, for example, I got married. I called them, right? That was a huge moment of change, right? I got ordained. I called them, right, for a moment of change. Uh, when we first started the TLC here during the youth group and stuff, I called them just to initiate the moment of change. And then this coming year, our leaders really felt like this is going to be a, a changing pivotal moment for TLC. So I decided, you know what, I usually don't like calling Steve because he always gives me a lot of hard time about it first. But I'm going to call him anyways, right? And he said this to me. He said, if I come. I'm going to come. I was like, what does that mean? He's like, you want me to come? I'm like, yeah, please. He's like, okay. Right? And he came and he literally taught the Bible for like four hours, like straight. I'm not even kidding. Four hours straight, you know? And I was like, no one can ever complain that we get out at 2.15 ever again, okay? He, go, and he does this every Sunday. Yeah, but it was really good, too. Right? He just really brought it home and brought the gospel back to the heart, which, which is what we really uh, prayed for, was the gospel to be centered back in our church, you know. And last week, the whole point was, last week Evan was sharing uh, about making room for Jesus. What he was really saying was this, who do you trust in? Like, when you have faith, what is it that you put your faith in? Is it Jesus and something? Is it Jesus and fill in the blank? Family, Jesus and money, Jesus and boyfriend, Jesus and girlfriend, Jesus and husband, Jesus and wife, Jesus and myself. What is it that you put your trust in? What is it that you put your faith in? Faith, guys, if you don't know the definition of faith, here it is. Faith is just pretty much a transfer of trust. Whatever it is that you have placed your whole trust in, you now transfer that trust and you put it in Jesus. Jesus is the object of your faith. When you jump off of a if your plane is going down, 
you're about to jump out the, the door, you're going to put your faith in something that can actually save you, right? The object of your faith would be a parachute, not a bag of gold bars. It's not going to help you. You guys get me? Right? And the whole point is this. What is it that you really trust? In? As you go through your distracted day-to-day -day life, as you go through your ups and downs, as you go through your um, routine of each day, what is it that you actually put your trust in? What is it that you actually put your hope in? Jesus or Jesus and something? You guys get me? And part of making room for Jesus is to constantly ask that question. You got to ask that question in your life daily. What am I putting my trust in today? What am I putting my hope in today? Is it really Jesus or Jesus and something? Because when you begin to ask that question, now you're making room for Christ. You guys get me? All right. Today is talking about making room for God's changing power. Okay. Let me tell you a story. In, uh, in college, I uh, hung out with a lot of Koreans. I was in a Korean ministry. And most guys in, Koreans, uh, in Korea, I mean Korean guys, their names are usually what? John? What? Daniel or Ed, Edward, what, in, what kind of Koreans have you been hanging out? David, right? Da, Daniel or David, it's like biblical, right? Or like if, if you're a kid, great. I'm not talking about last names, y'all, All right? If, if you're a girl, it's usually what? Grace, Esther, Sarah. Now, that one you guys know, all right? Anyway, right, in college, we had a lot of Davids, like a lot of David. And so we, had, we, we, we did nicknames to uh, differentiate each David, right? Like what my groomsmen, my groomsmen, um, his name was uh, David, but we call him Monkey, right? It's just, it's just Monkey. Don't have a monkey, we just call him Monkey, right? Why? One day he's a praise leader. One day he was up here, and he's pretty good. He's up there. He's like, hey, everyone, let's raise your hand. And he did, he did this motion that made him look like a gorilla. So then, like, someone in the crowd said, dude, David looks like a monkey, right? And then we just called calling him Monkey, right? It was just from that. To this day, we still call him Monkey, right? Uh, there was another David. Uh, we call him Nookie David, right? Nookie is a Korean word for uh, it just means excessively suave. I mean, you're so, like, you're so suave that you just kind of, like, kind of, kind of icky, you know? So we call him Nookie. So every time he comes off, he has some Nookie David, right? And then there's another David. We call him, he was my roommate. We call him Argentina, okay? Kind of weird, right? <laughs> it's because he was born in Argentina, and he spoke perfect uh, uh, Spanish, and so we wanted to differentiate him, so we just call him Argentina, you know? And, you know, the other two Davids, they're pretty cool about their nicknames. I didn't know this one didn't like his nickname, right? And so, you know, we see him on campus, hey, what's up, Argentina? And you'd be like, yeah, yeah, he walks on. One day we were sitting in our house and we were having our, um, our typical uh, Thursday night uh, Bible study. And he said, you know, hey, I'm not sure if I ever told you guys, but I, I don't really like to be called Argentina, right? And every guy in the house was like, oh, that's, that's awkward. Like, wh wh what do you want us to call you then? It's like, my name? It's like, oh. I was like, why? <laughs> right? And he was like, how would you like if I called you Vietnam? I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's weird, right? But, you know, don't you hate that? Don't you hate that people misrepresent you because based on one little thing they say about you? Don't you, don't you hate that? Like, when, when, when we call him Argentina, we just think that that's all he is. He's just... A Korean dude that has some sort of Hispanic background, you know, it's like this is it. He likes, you know, um, oh, what do you call those things? Uh, it's not tamales, they're like, uh, um, oh, dude, I forgot what it's called. But empanadas, empanadas, like he loves, he makes empanadas at home, right? And he was like, hey, this is your, her this is your heritage, bro. Like, so we thought that's who he was. Well, we didn't think that's who he was, but that's how, how he felt like we were looking at him as, right? As a, we misrepresent him as this tiny little sliver of a person when he's as this, this, this gamut of who he really is. And we're not really calling that into reality. We just kind of say, hey, Argentina. And every time we say that, we're trying to basically say, this is all you are. Right? Don't you guys hate that? When you, guys, when you post something on Facebook or you post something on Instagram and then everyone just like, kind of call you on, especially if you have a church people who are kind of a little more conservative, they call you out on it right, a little bit and they think like, that's all I am. Right? Like, how could you? Like, and it, doesn't that make you feel upset? Don't you feel upset by that? That you are somehow defined by one specific trait. Right? And yet, listen guys, and yet, you do this to God all the time. You hate it terribly. And yet, you do this to God all the time. How do I do this to God, Tony? Tell me how I misrepresent God, PT. Right, I'll tell you. When you simply go around and you say, oh, God is love, man. Man, God, that's, I love God, you know. I mean, don't worry about it. God is love. 
And that's he's love. And hey, I know what happened. Don't worry. God is love. How has God fundamentally changed you because of his love? What do you mean? Like, how has his love fundamentally changed you? Is that all he is? Is that he's just his love ball and then you just love by him? Oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm, he's making me live my best life possible. Right? You ever hear that phrase? I'm living my best life possible. Right? It feels like everyone else around you, dancing with you, also living your best life possible. So how is God's love different to you than it is to them? Well, I'm just trying to be the best version of me. Okay, like I feel like all the people you hang around with you are also trying to be the best version of themselves right now, right? How is, what is it about God that has fundamentally changed you? And he said, God is love. And God be like, how are you representing me like that? How, how you be like putting me in a box like that? How, how do you take everything that I am and then all of a sudden narrow it down, break it down to one tiny little facet of who I am that I am love and that's it? Is it true that he is love? It is true. It is very true that he is love. The fact that he would become, that God in his divine essence would become man, take on the very nature of a man, humble himself, become obedient and die for you because he saw you as precious he saw you as worth it. He saw you as his. That's love. No one else would have done that. He did it because he knew you could not pay. And what a precious, loving God. And so we go around, we say, God is my Savior, but you forget something. You know what you forget? You forget the second part, but he's also my Lord. Everyone look at each other and say, Jesus is my Savior and Lord. You know what that means? That Jesus will save you. From where your old life has been. Jesus will take your old life and he will save you from that life. But his lordship will never leave you in that life. His lordship will take you to your new life. And so how do you come in and you begin to represent God as merely God is love? All right? Today what I'm trying to say is this. When you come in and you talk about God as love only, do you know what happens? There is no change in your life. When you begin to kind of spew the nonsense that God is love only, there is no change in who you are fundamentally. There is no change in the way you live, no change in the way you think. There is nothing about God that is of worth redeeming for the fact that he is just love. I want to talk to you guys about making room for God's changing power today. Because if you are a Christian, you have to change. You guys follow me? Everybody look at each other and say, you got to change. If you are a Christian, there is no such thing as being stuck in one spot. If you are a believer, one day, sooner or later, you will change. And so when you are living your distracted life, the thing you should be asking yourself is this, am I changing? Is God changing me? Am I Allowing God to be Lord and Savior of my life? Or am I just going around saying God is love? Because if you're just going around saying God is love, you don't know the gospel. You're misrepresenting God and you're telling a story about God. And he's like, that's not me. Just like if someone around goes and look at your Facebook or your Instagram and start talking stories about you. And you'd be like, that's not me though. You know the pain of that. You know the struggle of that. And yet you would do the same. When it comes to God. So let me try to break it down for you guys today, okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to just do two verses. Verses 1 to 2. Okay, I know you guys are like, yes. I'm going to take an hour on this. <laughs> I'm going to do two verses. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Paul is preaching to this church because this church is a little broken. It's a little broken. This church is a church that has got into the habit of doing this. God is love. They got into the habit of just kind of saying and spewing out, God is love. I got to be relevant to the people around me. And so I'm just going to do that. What I mean by that is this. They'll go around in, in their community. They'll be like, hey, man, God loves you. God's forgiving. He died for you, man. God is love. So if you're sleeping with your stepmom, it's okay. We love you. We embrace you. Not that it's weird. We're not going to even say that. Not that it's awkward or just sick, right? We're just, we're going to love you because, you know, you do you. Because we want to love you. Because God is love. 
Or they'll be like, hey, you know what? God is love, but and, and love means I have to be connected to my culture. I need to be relevant to the world around me. And so wife, while you sleep, I'm going to go hang out at the temple and sleep with the temple prostitute. That's not really sex. It's really worship because I'm trying to, like, connect with the people there, right? So you get me. You get me, though, right? Don't be upset. You know, I'm, I'm not really sleeping with the temple prostitute. I mean, I am, but it's really about connecting to my culture. It was a church that began to fall into this issue of stagnant faith. A church that began to start saying to himself, God is love, and yet refused to change. You guys get me? And Paul is going to call them out on this. He's going to come and he's going to speak to them about this and call them forth from this. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Check this out. It says this, brothers and sisters... I cannot address you as spiritual but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Paul identifies the Corinthians church as, what's the word he used? Starts with a W. Worldly. Worldly. They are worldly Christian. What does it mean to be a worldly Christian? Right? A worldly Christian is this, basically a Christian who has put on the emergency brake to their spiritual growth. Here they were, they were stuck in a hole, they were lost, they recognized the, the futility of the cycle of shame and fear and just this wretched cycle of just chasing after something but never getting anywhere. They recognized that they needed to put their trust in something else that can save. They called out to their Savior, they called out to Jesus, He comes in, He saves them with His love, and now they're stuck. Instead of growing towards where they need to be, instead of going through the ups and downs of spiritual faith and battling with each other, battling with God with it, fighting God, fighting through with God, they decided, I'm just going to be stuck. They're, a worldly Christian is stubborn, someone who's stubborn, rebellious, resisting the leading of the Holy Spirit, and just plain fighting God. Not even fighting with God, just fighting God. All right? And I know some people, when, you, when, you, when, when someone who, you know, maybe they'll post something online and you're like, no, that, that person, you know, they may not even be Christian. You know, we call them worldly, but they're not even be, the word worldly Christian might, not, might mean that they're not even Christians. Why? Why would you say that? Look, PT, look, look how crazy. Like, have you not seen the pictures? Have you not seen what's going on here? Like, but yeah, but why do you say that? Because they're obviously sinning, man. Like, how much do I have to explain Really, just because they plastered their, foolishly plastered their life on social media and it seems pretty obvious that they're doing something stupid and they're not keeping it hidden, do you think that somehow, somehow you with your internal hidden sins, that that's different than their outward spoken sin? That somehow you who keep your sin hidden in your heart, that somehow you're better? No. We're all sinners. You guys get me? You guys, you guys get me? So let me ask this question. Is a worldly Christian a, a Christian? Oh, this is like, oh, I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so confused right now. <laughs> what if PT, like, what if I answered the wrong question? Put that first verse up again. Is a worldly Christian a Christian? Yes. How do we know? First one, please put it up again. Lily says, there you go, right? But as people who are still worldly, and the beautiful thing about Paul is he's going to define worldly. What is worldly? Mere what? Infants in who? In Christ. They're Christians, yes, but they're infants, right? They're babies. They're immature. Worldly. They're resisting. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. They're not trying to allow for God to lead them. They are believers, but they're stubborn. They're fighting God. Now, here's another question. Does this mean that they will stay this way forever? Does this mean that they will stay this way forever, stubborn, resisting, fighting? What do you guys think? Yes? No? Maybe? I don't know. Everybody look at each other and say no. No. You know why? Because Jesus saves, right? Je when Jesus saves, he changes a person's heart and a Christian will change. 
Do you guys know how much I believe in this? A Christian will change? I have bet my whole ministry on this truth, right? If this is not true, I am, I am so dead when I see God, right? I have bet TLC's legacy on this one truth, that a Christian will change. That it does not matter where you are right now, that if you call on God as your Lord and Savior, Savior and Lord, you will change. If he's more than just your loving God, but he's also your Lord, your master, you will change. See, Jesus is not just your Savior. He's Savior and Lord. Again, look at each other and say, Jesus is Savior and Lord. Okay. Don't, ever, don't ever cut that out, okay? Don't ever just, don't ever go around and just be talking like, Jesus is love, man. I just, he's love. He's Savior and Lord, okay? He's, this, this is how beautiful God is. He will find you and he will save you wherever you are. It doesn't matter how messed up you are. You don't, never come to me, right, and never tell your friends to come to me and say, I just got to get better before I show up to church, okay? That is a bunch of not nonsense, right? That's not even biblical. It's not biblical at all. Never come and say, PT, I have to get better before I do something. God will save you wherever you're at doesn't matter how deep of a hole you have dug yourself into. doesn't matter how messed up you think your life is. doesn't matter how shameful, how guilty you may be feeling personally about yourself. He will save you where, you are, where you're at, but he will never leave you where you are at. Do you guys get me? I mean, Justin Bieber gets this. I mean, that blew my, have you heard his testimony? Like, I, when my wife said, Tony. Oh, she's like, yeah, honey. <laughs> honey, check out his testimony. I'm like, who? Justin Bieber. I'm like, okay. Like, how? Google it. I'm like, okay. So I Googled it. And I was listening to it. I was like, you know, like, maybe he's just kind of like espousing, just kind of like, oh, God is love. Like, just typical, right? God is love. And we all, sh- as he's talking, as he's sharing, I'm like, do I think he gets it? I actually, I really think this guy gets it. That Jesus is not just his savior. And I'm, I'm using Justin Bieber as an example. I'm sorry, right? <laughs> that he's not just his savior, but that he is saying, he is also my Lord. There's an obedience there's a change that must come in my life because of that. I was like, dude, not bad, right? Jesus is not just there just to pick up your mess whenever you need him. Just because he loves you, right? He's not a janitor. Jesus says, the I who started a work in you, I will see it to completion. Can you be a believer and never change? Can you be a believer and never change? No. It is impossible. It is impossible for you to say, PT, Jesus is my Savior. I love him. I have received him as my, my Lord. And your life stays stagnant. It is impossible. Because Jesus, once he saves, he continues to save. Because your best version of yourself It's not how you look in the mirror. Your best version of yourself is how much you look like Jesus Christ. You guys follow? Right? Your best life now is not how much fun you're having at this moment. Your best life now is how much you're battling for the hope that's to come, for the glory that's waiting for you. Can you be a believer who has pulled the emergency brake on your spiritual life? Is it possible for you to be a believer that has literally pulled the emergency brake on your spiritual life and you're now being stubborn, rebellious, resisting the Holy Spirit? Is it possible? I'll say it loud and proud. Yes. Okay. Everyone's so scared, man. Like, look, we're here. Okay. If you're wrong, I'll correct you, right? If you're right, I'll affirm you, okay? Don't worry. Okay, here we go. It's possible. Yes. It is possible for a believer to be what we call worldly. Now, what is the characteristic of a worldly Christian? You guys ready? What is the characteristic of a worldly Christian? Check this out. First Corinthians chapter, verse 2. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready for it. You are mere infants in Christ. See, Paul addresses their worldliness. The word worldliness here is he's, he's, he's connecting it to infants. Infants, pretty much what he's saying is that you are immature. 
the definition, the characteristic of a worldly Christian is that you are resisting, you are fighting, you are uh, not listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit, but you are immature in your faith. You're immature in your life. Now let me ask you this question. You're, you're, I'm sorry, you're immature like a baby like, is immature, who doesn't know much, right? Here's a question. Is it a problem or is it a sin to act like a baby? To be immature like a baby. Is it a sin? No. If? If you're a baby, right? I mean, if Enoch, he lives in my house, right? What does he do? He eats, he sleeps, he poops, right? He pees, he pukes, and my wife says, oh, I love you, right? He's doing all that stuff a baby should be doing. He's not mowing the lawn, right? I mean, I want him to. He's not cleaning my dishes, not doing the laundry, doesn't pick up after himself, doesn't contribute financially to the family in any way, right? I mean, Ryan Toys, have you heard of Ryan Toys? That, that homie is contributing to his family, okay? That guy's making $22 million a year. I was like, put my kid on YouTube right now, right? I was like, please, how is that possible, okay? But you look at your kid, you know he's not going to be able to mow the lawn, do the dishes, do all that stuff, because why? He's immature, he's an infant, he's a child, he's, un, he's unable to do those things, and that's cute. You think that it's cute. Now think about this. Now you're 25 years old. 25 years old. You're pooping and peeing and puking, screaming in the middle of the night because you're hungry. That mug ain't cute no more, right? Some of y'all write that down right now. It is not cute, right? It is not cute when you're, it's cute when you're a baby. When you're old like that, dude, you need to feed yourself, okay? Get your butt up. There's a kitchen. Make your own food, okay? You need to get a job. You need to grow up because they ain't cute anymore. Immaturity, the picture of immaturity is this, is that you are someone that looks after yourself. You are someone that feeds, that says, feed me, care for me. How can I receive? What can I get out of it? What benefits me for here? You have no concept of other people's lives. You have no concept of what's going on. You're not conscientious of what's going on in their life, right? In Vietnamese, I always use this word to my salt guy. I say, you guys have to learn to big deal, right? Figure it out. Stop thinking about yourself. What's urgent for you has to be urgent for everybody else. Everyone has to stop their whole life because your life is going through a mess. That's immaturity. Maturity is this. You know what's up, right? You know there's a lot of people in this world. My emergencies are not everybody's emergencies. I don't need everybody to give to me. I can give to them. I can serve them. I can contribute. I exist for a bigger part of this world, and the world doesn't exist for my well-being. When you come to church, guys, on Sundays, what do you come here for? Do you come to receive or do you come to give? Do you come to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to our God? Or do you come to take and say, feed me, PT. Give me a story that make me laugh. Entertain me today. Right? Let me walk away and say, that was a good sermon. I remember that illustration pretty well. And I'm not going to forget it tomorrow. But I was, at least for a moment, I'm entertained. Why did you come here today? Did you come here to offer a sacrifice of praise when you sing your songs to your God? Did you come to say, dang, Chris, why is every single Sunday like a cafe night? Right? Where is, where is, the, where is the energy in the room? Right? That's me. I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> You know, what did you come to do? Is it come, did you come to give or did you come to take? And this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church. I didn't give you when you, when you first started off, when, we, when I first founded you, when I first gathered you guys together, I preached the gospel to you, I gave you milk. Because you were babies, you were immature, you didn't know what, you, I, had, I had to give you milk. But it's been 10 years I still have to give you milk. You should be eating solid food by now. You should be praying for yourself by now. You should be learning how to open the Bible by now. You should be serving by now. You should be doing it without anyone forcing you or pushing you or trying to, like, negotiate with you to do it by now. You know, every, every, I'll tell you, I'm breaking it down real fast for you guys. Every 
church cleanup day, right? We do it once a year. Every church cleanup day, I always got one or two parents coming to me and be like, hey, PT, where's the EM? Right? And I'm like, hey, what's the VM, <laughs> right? You know? But I was, like, I was like, what do you mean? I'm right here. I'm EM right here. I represent EM. He's like, no, no, no. What's the rest of your people? You know what I always have to say to them? I say, hey, when they grow, they'll come. It's like, it's been seven years. Like, don't remind me. Don't remind me. But when they grow, they'll come. Right? When they, when they start realizing that this community, this body, this ownership of it, when they start seeing trash on the ground and realize that's, that's wrong. I mean, if you can clean your room, or some of you guys don't, that's probably why, right? right? If, if you know that this is your body, this is your community, this is your place, you don't need me to, like, make signs and stuff. I say, just come. We need to clean up this place. Come. When, you, when they grow, they'll come. And, that, and every year they say, but are they? I'm like, hey. I'm patient, right? As long as they're growing (laughs) slowly. Paul is saying to the church, you're a bunch of babies. You're a bunch of babies. You've been Christians for a few years now, and you're still not willing to give. You're not praying. You're not serving. You're not doing anything. You sit there. You scream. And everybody has to stop their lives, have to run and do and give whatever it is that you say. In your distracted life, how do you make room for Jesus? In your distracted life, when you go through the ups and downs, or whatever it is that's so distracting to you, how do you make room for Jesus? The question that you should be asking is, am I growing? Am I changing? Or am I stuck? Am I a worldly believer? I know people don't like that word because it has a really weird connotation. So let me give you this. Am I immature in my faith? Am I so immature in my faith that I am rebellious, that I'm stubborn when it comes to God? I'm not listening. I'm not, le- I'm not listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I should be leading by now, but I don't want to lead because that means responsibility. That means that I have to actually own up and man up to the things that I have to do. So I don't want to lead. I don't want to make decisions. I don't want to be that point person. I'd rather be the second because that person doesn't have to re- deal with any responsibilities. Immaturity or maturity. When Paul says, you are worldly, infants in Christ, what he's saying is this. You're immature. There's an immaturity that is a characteristic of your life. So let me ask you a few questions, okay? What areas in your life are spiritually immature before God? For some of you, it's pretty obvious, okay? You go out, you do something stupid, you wake up, Two weeks later, and you find yourself on cops, and you're like, oh, that's, that's not good. I shouldn't have done that, right? That's pretty obvious, right? Pretty out there. For others, it's less obvious because it's more internal. Secret, and you've learned to justify it. you learn to excuse it. you learn to say, you know, that's just part of who I am. You really can't change, PT. That's just my life, right? Your unforgiveness. That's just who I am. You don't know the, the, the background I've gone through. You don't know the hurt I've felt. Okay? Money. You don't know how much my family had to struggle with it. Drugs, sex, alcohol, pornography, partying, your mouth, your temper. What areas in your life is spiritually immature before God? Now listen, guys. I'm not saying that you're one or the other. You guys get me? I'm not saying you're all one or you're all the other. There's areas of your life that I know that you're very mature in. There's areas of your life that you're very immature in. Some of you guys are very mature when it comes to your finances. You've gotten a job, right? You work hard. You're paying your bills. You're out of debt. You're saving. You're investing. You take portion and you give regularly. You got your finances all buttoned up. You're very mature when it comes to that. But then in other areas of your life where you're very immature, okay, you're petty. You look down on people. Right? Areas of your life that you keep hidden. You sleep around. Like, don't act like I don't know. Guys, like, let's, let's not talk about it out loud. Areas of your life that we just kind of like let, or we, we kind of sweep under the rug because we make excuses for it. And the reason why we can make excuses for it, you know why? Because we lean very heavily on the areas where we feel very mature. Right? 
you lean on an area that you feel so mature and you're like, you know what? This hopefully can make the excuse for this. This, this I hope all that I've done, my maturity, my leadership, my, my being there, my service, all of that should make up for the little tiny things that I'm actually immature about. I'm just sweeping under the road. Not anyone will know. Just let's, let's make an excuse. Yeah, I know. I know I'm like that, but look at what I'm doing here. Some of you are just, you're immature. You're immature when it comes to your prayer life, your devotion. You're immature when it comes to your heart. You're immature when it comes to your sexual ethics. You're immature when it comes to your walk. You put down, you belittle. What areas in your life is immature? Spiritually mature. What is it? Do you know why, listen guys, do you know why oftentimes <clears throat> you feel stuck in your Christian walk? Do you know why? It's not because you didn't do more. PT, like I led. Why do I feel still so stuck? PT, like, like literally, I went to missions with you. I'm spiritual, I'm, I'm leading, I'm doing, I'm doing all these things. Why do I feel so stuck? Because the areas where you are immature, you have failed to obey. Growth and change only occurs when you begin to deal with the areas of immaturity and you start the process of obedience in those areas. You never grow and you never change until you actually begin to deal with the things that are difficult to deal with. All right? So it brings me to the third question. The areas in your life that you call immature, when do you plan to address it? When do you plan to address it? The church in Corinth, they've been festering in their immaturity for a couple of years now. And Paul saying, it's cute when you were two weeks old, but man, it's time to get potty trained. It's time to grow up. It's cute when we first started, I get it, you know. When you first started the whole entire sleeping with prostitutes, it was part of your whole culture. I get that. You know what, what Christ says about the sexual ethic? He said that the marriage bed is meant for the marriage bed. There's beauty in that. There's worth in that. And when two couples come together in marriage, it is the redefining of their contract, their, their love relationship over and over for God. There's a beauty in that. There's a reason for that. You don't take that lightly. So when you first started, of course, I get it. You, you jump back and forth because, you know, your babies. But it's been seven years, ten years. What are you going to do about it? Well, that's who I am, man. I'm just, I just can't keep it in my pants, PTI. I don't know what to do. That's great. I'm glad you acknowledge it. When do you plan to change? When do you plan to do something about it? Are you just going to sweep it under the rug and just lean heavier on the things that you are mature about? Some of you, some of you plan that you're just going to wait indefinitely and see what happens. Some of you think that if you keep breathing, eventually I'll get better, right? Eventually, if I just keep breathing, I age enough, I will get better. How many of you guys hate it when the adults t tell you, listen to me because I'm older than you, right? I know I'm not the only one. They use their age as a weight against you, right? But there are, I promise you, there are 80-year-old people who are as immature and as stubborn and as rebellious and as resistant to God as ever. It doesn't matter how old they are. It gives them no power. And yet there are still some 20-year-olds who have dealt with their immaturity, who have fought the battle of obedience, who did what they needed to do and are at this time mature before the Lord because they're willing to make the change. Some of you guys are like, I'm single, I'll wait till I get married to be mature, okay? No, please be mature before you get married, right? <laughs> That's just, please, okay? Or, I'm married, I'll wait till I become a parent to mature, right? What's that word that you guys use? Um, adulting, right? I, I, I'm, I'm going through adulting right now. As if adulting is a pro seriously, it's either you are mature or you're immature, you're moving towards it. Adulting is just... Um, being responsible for the first time. No, you're being mature, actually. You're being a mature person. You hate it when people use the age to basically rule over you. 
But you do the exact same thing when you start getting into that mindset. When you start saying, I'll get mature when I get older. Right? You hate it when older people use their age to tell you what to do. And somehow you get into the habit of saying, I'll mature when I get older. I'll use my age then. By that time, whatever age that is, I'll be mature. Okay? There should be a sense of urgency. We shouldn't wait till there's a crisis in your life to move towards maturity. Because by that time, by that time of like, okay, finally, I'm going to be mature. You have racked and wreaked havoc throughout your life that you have to have to go backwards to fix. Right? Kind of like your educational system. All y'all who trying to be like communication majors and you have to go back another six years to actually find another major. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Right? Just, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Communication. I love communications. I'm sorry. Right? But you know what I'm talking about. When you, you're talking about like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait till I get older and I'll be mature. And you get there and you're like, okay, I'm going to be mature now. And then you realize the huge havoc you messed up along the way and you have to go all the way back and start from the beginning to fix it all over again. There should be an urgency in your life right now to be obedient to this moment right now. Some of you ladies are in relationships and you're mouthy, you're difficult, you're not empathetic at all. And you're wondering why your relationship is in a mess. And you say, that's who I am though. I can't change that about myself. That's who I am. Well, that's great. I'm glad you acknowledge that you're weird, right? But when do you expect to change that? Um, I don't expect to change that. <laughs> then you got a problem. You see, a Christian always change. That is the mark of most how I see most brothers in our church. As long as you change, I'm good. As long as you're moving forward. You can move like in zigzags, honestly, right? And maybe take a few steps back. But as long as you're changing. That's the goal. I know, let me tell you guys this. You know, TLC, we got, we got into this, um, got into this kind of like a weird rep that, you know, we're very, uh, we're very progressive church, you know, we're not rigid like a lot of the other uh, Vietnamese churches are, right? And it's like, yeah, it's so cool, you know. You know, we, we're, we're, we're open to a lot of things. We're, that's great. I mean, it's true. You know, we are. We're not, we're not as rigid and uh, I respect that. But that's not the rep I want, kind of, actually. Sometimes I'm like, well, when are we going to be the adult church, right? Instead of the cool, like, weird church on the side that's, like, doing everything opposite of everyone else for, like, centuries, when are we going to actually be the adult church and lead the church? To lead people. To bring them into the 21st century and to say, look, this is where we're going. This is where the gospel is taking us. We're going to go. Would you go with us? All right? And some of you guys may think, like, hey, you know, PT, PT is, like, he's, he's soft. He's soft on a lot of people. Like, he sees things, he doesn't say anything about it. Oh, no, 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 no. Right? I see it. Right? And I'm just pondering in my head, always thinking, when should I lay down the holy smack down? Right? Like, do I just trust that maybe it's just a season? It's just a moment? Something stupid? Or it's time to throw it down right now. Right? Because when you throw it, it's going to be bad. But the reason why, it's not soft to wait patience because I believe like I said I bet my whole ministry on it that a Christian can change that God is your Savior and Lord you will change if he's just your Savior yeah maybe you have a problem okay that's when the talk comes but if he's Savior and Lord I know you can change it's not even by your power that change it is by the power of the Holy Spirit compelling you to change. Telling you it's enough. Telling you no more. Telling you let go. Telling you stop. You will change. And you will grow. That I know. So whenever you come and say stuff like, oh, that's who I am. Great. When do you plan to change? Some of you young men or in relationships, and you're overbearing, you're harsh, you're selfish towards your significant other, and you say, that's who I am. Cool. When are you going to change? When do you expect to change? Some of you, maybe it's not relationships. Some of you, maybe it's other areas. 
your social life, your work ethic, your character, your mouth, your temper. I don't know what your thing is, but you all have a thing. You all have a thing that is very mature, that is maturing, and you have a thing that is not at all. That you literally sweep under the rug and you hide it, you justify it, you make every single excuse for why it's okay, and you don't do anything about it. And you say, that's who I am, though. That's what it is. That's just the issue. Great, I'm glad you know. When are you going to do something about it? Right? If it's causing your life not to move forward, you got to bring it up. If you find yourself stuck in your Christian walk and you think, how come I'm not experiencing God, PT? Right? How come I don't know who, when was the last time you obeyed him? When was the last time he spoke something into your life, specifically some area in your life that you know that you ought to be working on or ought to be fighting with, right? But you're not, and you're saying, I don't see God moving. Ask any believer who have walked the walk, who have fought the fall, who have ran the race, ask him the stories of obedience. Just ask him any story. Give me a story of the time when you obeyed God. What happened? What happened the time when you surrendered to God? You know what happens usually? Change happens. It always happens after obedience. You know what the difference between Adam and Jesus was? They were both made perfect, right? They were both made perfect. But the only difference between Adam and Jesus is that Jesus obeyed. He obeyed to the cross. Adam, he was scared of his wife, right? He done messed up, right? And his, his action, guess what? Messed everybody up. Can you imagine Jesus who loved you so much? He came to earth and he just said, I love you. I love you. Just remember that. I love you. Maya, love you, man. And that's it. I'll see you guys later. 2,000 years, I'll come back, right? Well, what happened? Nothing, right? Because there would be no change. Words are cheap. But what did he do? He obeyed the Father. He obeyed the Father. He said, I don't want to. <laughs> Can you take this cup from me? But I'm going to do it. And his obedience brought change. It changed the world. It changed the lives of people. It changed your life. Right? Jesus is not just Savior. He is Savior and Lord. You can never say, I am a believer, but I will not change. You cannot make excuses for the areas of your life that are immature and kind of sweep it under the rug and think that, you know what, as long as nobody knows about it, as long as we don't bring it up to the public, as long as it's not in the light, we're okay. No. Yeah, okay, you can fool me. You can fool your church. You can fool your church family. But you can't fool God. And you can't fool yourself. And you know in your life whether you're growing or not growing. You know in your life whether you are actually maturing and actually experiencing God or just sitting around and just waiting and saying, you know what, why am I just going through the motion not feeling and sensing anything? Obedience is the mark of a Christian. And so... My prayer to you is this, guys. Um, as you go through your distracted life, whatever it may be, school, work, family, church, as you go through your distracted life, ask the question, am I allowing God's changing power to occur in my life? Am I dealing with the areas that are immature in my life? Am I dealing with the areas that are hard, that's stubborn, that's prideful, unforgiving, full of anger, full of wrath? Am I dealing with areas of my life that is lost, broken? Am I actually wrestling with God in the areas of obedience? Because otherwise, what are we doing? Just playing up a show here. What are we doing? Our church would be just be a church full of people with no power. 
because we don't sense God's power. Because we have lacked the power to obey. God is more than just love. He is Savior. Yes, that is true. But he is Savior and Lord of your life. So let him be Lord of your life. If you trust that God has taken you here, then trust that he will take you further. Trust him when it comes to these areas. Trust. That's the whole point everyone was talking about last week was trust. It is to trust in the object of your faith. He is worthy of that trust. To trust that if he is taking you this far, he's not going to leave you now. He's going to take you further. Your king has not wronged you since. And if you have walked along his truth and his word, he will not wrong you further. Your king is for you. He is never against you. Your king has given his life to show you that you are able to grow. Your best life now is not now. Your best life here is to live and to run the race for the hope and the glory that's to come. And the better version of yourself is not whatever you look like in the mirror. The better version of yourself is Christ in you. So my brothers and sisters, would you change? Would you obey as you go through your distracted life? Ask the question, where am I immature and where am I seeking to obey God in? Let's pray.